Okay, let's uh, get started. Uh, smaller class today, not surprisingly, just before spring recess. I will do my best to uh, reward you for showing up with uh, some very interesting work on biped bipedal robots. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, where we were and where we're going. Um, I forgot that last Tuesday was um, town hall meeting day. I always do. Uh, so I've updated the schedule here. We're going to talk about bipedal locomotion today. We will probably finish lecture 12 and we'll probably work partway through uh, our section on uh, modularity. And I realize now I still need to make another change. Modularity is actually going to be the first of several challenges in the field we're going to start uh, looking at. So lecture 12 is going to conclude our section on uh, sort of the early experiments in evolutionary robotics, sort of the history of. We've looked at some pretty simple ones. We're going to end today with bipedal locomotion, and this experiment definitely is not trivial. It's got a lot of moving pieces, so we'll work our way through it today. And then again, we'll start talking about one of the challenges, open problems in evolutionary robotics today, uh, modularity. Okay, so uh, on Tuesday for the undergraduates, hopefully you got started on assignment eight. Um, assignment eight is not due until the Tuesday we get back after spring race recess. So you have two weeks to work on assignment eight, um, which is probably a good thing because despite the fact that there are only 63 steps to assignment eight, there's a fair bit of work that you're going to have to do in this assignment. The reason why is because you are going to be turning your minimal two object one joint robot into a nine object uh, eight joint quadrupedal robot. So quite a few steps in assignment eight. Um, you'll see throughout the assignment um, I try and give you a, a, a direction to move in which is to do this very incrementally. So I suggest when you start to add objects and build this quadruped from the ground up, you add one object to make sure it's the right size, right position, right orientation, then add the second one, make sure it's in the right position, right size, right orientation, uh, and so on, all the way through the nine objects. Then add the first of the eight joints, make sure that joint is in the right position, it's connecting the right pair of objects together, that the joint normal is pointing in the right direction, which you'll know based on how the objects rotate relative to one another. Then add in the second joint, make sure it's in the right place, connecting the right pair of objects, right orientation. So it's a lot of rinse and repeat uh, in this, this assignment. You've got two weeks to do it, so hopefully this will not uh, be an issue. When you finish, you will have, uh, you'll have nine objects, uh, eight joints. You'll be spending quite a bit of time building up this engineering drawing. Uh, I did this in Google, uh, what is it, Google Draw. You can do it in any drawing program you want. Make sure that you annotate this uh, drawing with positions and orientations and sizes and lengths and so on as you, as you go. Okay, um, and then now the fourth panel uh, you can set aside for sketching out the neural network. Again, do this incrementally. Uh, add in your four touch sensors. You're then going to add in a fifth sensor, which is a uh, a position sensor, four sensor neurons that connect to the four touch sensors, and a total of eight motor neurons. And again, add these incrementally, and then finally add in the synapses. How many total synapses is the quadrupedal robot going to have? Remember, we don't really count this one because this one is just transferring the value from the sensor to the sensor neuron. 32, right? For each of the four sensor neurons, each of those sensor neurons has eight synapses connecting to the eight motor neurons. So you have a total of 32 synapses at the end. Okay, so just to wrap up, nine objects, eight joints, five sensors, eight motors, uh, and 32, 32 synapses. Okay, um, one other thing I want to point out about assignment uh, eight is down towards the end here, step 52, 53, and 54. 
you can see that when you send your motor neurons, we're going to now also send a tau value um, to this motor neuron, which we have not been doing up till now. What does a tau, how does a tau change the behavior of the neuron to which it's associated? It's, it's going to slow it, exactly, it slows the neuron. In this case, it's slowing the motor neuron, which is going to slow the rate of change of desired angles that are sent to the motor. So before step, uh, before step 52 or so, you're going to have a robot that is pretty energetic, like you'll see here. Um, and it doesn't take much for it to jump all over the place and flip itself over and, and so on. So we're going to try and slow the movement of this robot so that it's not doing things like this. Okay. Okay, in step 54, I actually realized there was a typo in this. So for the, for the students that have already gone through and done the quadruped, you're all fine. I forgot to actually include the tau in the equation here, right? So we should all be familiar with this by now. This is showing that the, val the new value of neuron i at time step t is going to be some function of its previous value plus the influence coming in from the other neurons that connect to neuron i. So just to remind ourselves, if tau sub i is equal to 0, then the new value of the neuron is going to be basically the same as the old neuron. It's going to decay a little bit because 10H. 10H tends to squash everything gradually down to, to zero, right? So by setting tau equal to 0.3, the default is 1. We're going to slow the rate of change of this, this motor neuron. Okay, I think that's it. I think everything else in, uh, in, the, quadruped, uh, in the quadruped assignment is pretty straightforward. Any questions? Okay, um, for the grad students that are working on their final projects, I've received a number of questions about some aspects of PyroSim, so I'll just broadcast this now in case it's useful to you. Um, throughout these projects, you've been introduced to some of the sensors in PyroSim, but not all of them. There is an additional one that might be useful to some of you, which is the vestibular sensor. So if you go have a look in pyrosim.py, you'll see that there's an add vestibular sensor. And what the vestibular sensor does, like your inner ear, which is where your vestibular sensor is, is it gives you back information about orientation relative to gravity. So if you have an object in your simulation and you embed a vestibular sensor in it, at every time step, PyroSim will compute a normal that's pointing out of the top of the object. If the object is perfectly horizontal, then the normal is pointing directly up. And as the object starts to tilt away from horizontal, this normal vector will stray further from the horizontal vector. So what the vestibular sensor does is return the angle between a perfectly vertical vector and the normal pointing out of the top of the object. So obviously, if the object is perfectly horizontal, the vestibular sensor, sensor will return a value of 0. And if the object flips upside down, it will return a maximum value, which I think is probably pi. I think it's reporting angles in, in radians. I'm not 100% sure, but, but there you go. OK, so if you're doing something where you're trying to keep the robot level, you might want to add a vestibular sensor, grab the data back from the vestibular sensor, and penalize the robot for tilting too far away from the, the vertical. OK, that's one thing that might be useful to you. Um, another thing that might be useful is at the moment, uh, in PyroSim, it will detect and resolve collisions only between objects and the ground. Any other pair of objects, it will ignore those collisions. So if you have, for example, a robot and you're trying to get it to climb up on top of another object, the robot will just pass through the, the object. 
So if you do, uh, if you do want your robot to climb on objects or pick up objects, or if you've got multiple robots and you want them to not interpenetrate, um, let me know and I will have to spin off a new version of PyroSim for you, or I will tell you how to change the C code in order to make that, that happen. It's a less trivial change, but, but it is possible. Just, just let me know. Okay, any other questions about the assignments or final project? Um, for, so we learned how to slow down motor neurons. Yes. But if I'm doing the wheel of the robot, I need it to go faster. Ah, okay. Easy way to change that. Uh, that is a good question. Yes, so when you create a, a wheel, you're uh, turning position control to false. So there's a flag on the motor neuron, um, if I remember correctly. There's a flag on the motor neuron, you say position uh, position control equals false, which means now the motor neuron will dictate desired velocity rather than desired position. Right. You can still set the low and the high stop on a motor neuron. Um, and you can go and have, or maybe that's on the joint. I will have to go back and, and look, but you can set the lower high stop. So if you set that to, so what that, uh, for a wheel, low and high means the minimum velocity and the maximum velocity. So if you decrease low and increase high, your wheels will spin faster forward and spin faster backward. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So let's get back to uh, lecture. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention about, uh, about the schedule. Um, I've been taping the office hours that I hold on Twitch uh, on Mondays. And in between questions, I've been sort of talking about some other aspects uh, of evolutionary robotics that, aren't gonna, that I don't have time to talk about in the class. So if you're interested, you can go back and watch those. Uh, on Monday, I talked about yet another evolutionary algorithm called a steady state evolutionary algorithm. For those of you that have got all the way through the assignments, you might have noticed that the genetic algorithm has one major problem with it, which is it doesn't maintain diversity very well. Once there's one robot in the population that's a fair bit better than the other robots in the population, its descendants will very quickly take over the entire population and drive all the other robots from the other species to extinction. So the steady state evolutionary algorithm is a pretty simple evolutionary algorithm and it's a relatively easy way to maintain a little bit more diversity in the population. Still not great at maintaining diversity, but better than a genetic algorithm. Uh, when we come back after spring recess, uh, I will, if again I have time on my Monday office hours, build on top of the steady state evolutionary algorithm to produce yet another evolutionary algorithm that's even better at maintaining diversity. So I'll gradually keep walking through more and more complex evolutionary algorithms that are a little bit more high powered. If you want to use one of those, go follow along as I code them up in the taped office hours. If you want to stick with the genetic algorithm, that's also perfectly, perfectly fine. Okay, so back to uh, locomotion. Uh, we started lecture 11 last week by trying to answer the question, why don't plants have brains? Because they don't need to move. There is this fundamental connection between self-movement and intelligence. The moment you have to start moving in the world, the whole world seems to be moving. Uh, seems to be moving, right? There's such, there's a lot of change in your world if you're moving. And the moment there's change, you're going to have to try and maintain whatever you're doing amidst all of that change. And in order to do that, Mother Nature has to, has evolved brains to handle it, right? So uh, that's what that's one of the main reasons that roboticists spend so much time thinking about movement and, and specifically legged uh, locomotion. Okay, so back to lecture 12, where we started to talk about uh, bipedal locomotion last time. We watched our Monty Python sketch showing us that there isn't just walking and running when it comes to bipedal uh, locomotion. Then we looked at two robots that are at two ends of the scale, at two opposite ends of the spectrum of striking a balance between um, speed, energy efficiency, robustness, and stability. We saw the Asimo robot, which moves relatively quickly, but is extremely energy inefficient. It's carrying a battery in its backpack there. And at the opposite end of the spectrum, we saw the passive dynamic walker, 
which has no motors at all, right? This is strictly not even a robot. There's no sensors, no motors, just a mechanical contraption. And then finally, uh, we ended with the hybrid dynamic walker, Denise, which is mostly passive, but for, at a certain point in the gait cycle, there are motors that give a little bit of kick to swing the leg forward, which allows Denise to walk on flat ground. So her, the range of environments that she can walk in is broader than the purely passive dynamic walker, which could only walk in one environment, which is this particular decline wooden plane, which is at three de degrees dissension. Right? So by adding in a little bit of power, by decreasing the energy efficiency, we broaden the robustness of our uh, robot walker. OK, so what we're going to look at today what we're going to look at today is uh, again another one of my favorite papers in the field, which is an attempt to evolve, first of all, a passive dynamic walker. And then, once we've evolved a, a passive dynamic walker, can we continue evolution and gradually turn the passive dynamic walker into a hybrid dynamic walker? That's what we're going to look at today. Let's start with step one. How can you possibly evolve a passive dynamic walker if a passive dynamic walker has no sensors or motors, it has no neural network to evolve. Do you mean like in nature or in tyrosine? Uh, just in general. We're going to evolve it. It doesn't matter about the simulator. Let's imagine you have pyrosim or some simulator. You want to evolve a passive dynamic walker that walks down a declined plane. You evolve its morphology. So I mentioned at the beginning of this course that the reason why we're going to spend so much time talking about evolutionary algorithms rather than learning algorithms is because learning algorithms are specific to the brain, right? They sculpt the brain to produce adaptive behavior. But evolution is not restricted to just optimizing brain. Evolution optimizes body and brain together. And now we're sort of entering the second half of the course. We're going to see more and more experiments where the investigators placed aspects of both the body and the brain under evolutionary control. So in step one, we're going to see that the investigators evolved just the body of the passive dynamic walker, because there was no brain. And then in step two, they continue evolving the brain, but they, or they continue evolving the body, but they also add a brain and now evolve both together. Okay, again, a lot of moving pieces in this experiment, so we'll take it one, one piece at a time. Let's have a look at our passive dynamic walker. Its body is pretty simple. We've got, uh, we've got our two legs, obviously, and we've got a number of joints. So each of the legs is connected to the hip with two hinge joints, one which allows the leg to swing forward and back, and the second which allows the leg to swing inward or outward. One degree of freedom at the knee, like our knee, and two rotational degrees of freedom at the ankle. So two hinge joints that allow the uh, foot to rotate up and down, and also uh, yawing. So tipping the, the toes inward toward the center or outward uh, away from the center line of the, the body. They also put some lead weights on the robot, these thigh masses and shank masses. Why do you think they're adding these lead blocks? Why would you possibly want to make your robot heavier? For momentum. Where, where are they going to place these? Where do you place these blocks to increase your chance of getting passive dynamic walking? Not so intuitive. So if it's not so intuitive, what do you think they're going to do? Evolve or stop the molded top on position? They're going to, they're going to evolve where these uh, masses are placed, so evolution can change the mass distribution of this, this machine. OK, so let's look at this in a little more detail now. So here's this robot instantiated in uh, Open Dynamics Engine, remember, which is the physics engine underlying Pyrosim. They have a number of parameters here uh, that they're going to evolve. So there's uh, also a, a mass that's placed on the waist up there at the top, MW, masses on the thigh, shank, and foot, so MT, MS, and MF. 
They're also going to evolve the length of the leg segments. So the actual height of the robot itself, the upper leg and lower leg are always going to be the same length. That's why we have one L for both upper leg and lower leg. They're going to evolve the mass, the X offset and the Y offsets of the point masses. So here's our Y axis here. So the Y axis is going to indicate how far forward of the leg or behind the leg the mass is placed. So is it attached to the front shin or is it placed on the back of the leg or embedded in the center of the leg? And we're also going to evolve the X offset. So is it on the outside of the leg or on the inside of the leg? They're also going to evolve the length of the foot. The radius of the, they're going to evolve the radius of the waist. So how, what, how broad is the, the waist? And finally, B sub Y, which is the starting hip angle around the Y axis. I think that's actually a typo. I think this should be the starting hip angle about the X axis. Because what they're talking about here, the starting hip angle, is in order for the passive dynamic walker to walk at all, we have to start by placing one leg in front of the other. So we have to rotate the hip to some angle to get one of the legs forward of the, the other one. Actually, you can see that here, yeah. So it's definitely supposed to be B sub X here, not B sub uh, Y. Why start by placing one of the legs up in the front of the robot? Why not just take both feet and put them on the top of this downward ramp? Gravity? Gravity, there's no way, it can't do, it can't get started, right? All it can do is fall fall forward. We have to evolve the initial position of the robot so that it can get started down the, the ramp. Okay. We're also going to introduce another aspect in robotics which we haven't seen yet, which is spring damping systems. So they're also going to add a number of springs, which you can see are near joints. So they're connect the, the springs, like the joints, are also connecting together pairs of objects. These springs are like normal springs. They're passive. If they're pulled longer than their length, they will pull back and pull the objects towards one another. If during motion the spring is compressed, the spring will start to push the objects apart again. You'll notice that there are two springs placed on the front of the foot and the side of the foot, and also on the front of the upper leg and the front of the hip and the inner side of the front leg and the center of the, uh, the waist of the, the robot. Okay, so we've got one, two, three, four, and then there is a fifth, uh, there is a fifth spring around the knee, which is just not shown here. So we've got a total of five springs down the length of one leg, another five down the other leg. For each of those five springs, there are two numbers that specify the behavior of that spring. It's stiffness and it's damping. So stiffness is pretty straightforward. If you have a very stiff spring, it's going to resist compression and extension. It's not so easy to push or pull on it. Damping is the amount of recoil when it actually is compressed or extended. So here's my little scribbles here to sort of show how this works. Imagine we have uh, we have a, a spring which has high stiffness and high damping. If we try and compress it, we can't compress it very far. And because there's high damping, once we let go, it will very quickly return to its rest length. So every spring has a certain length that it likes to be at, its rest length. If you pull it beyond that length, it'll try and uh, compress back. If you cr compress beyond that rest length, it'll try and extend back. Okay, that's high stiffness, high damping. Let's keep high damping, but now make low stiffness. So now it's easy to compress it to much shorter than its rest length. And when it bounces back, it'll actually go to more than it, longer than its rest length. Because it has a high damping, this oscillation will, eventually, will relatively quickly be damped out, and it'll go back to its rest length. Same thing down here, we have high stiffness and low stiffness, but now we have no damping, right? It'll just keep oscillating forever or for a very long time. So two numbers 
that we can use to specify how a single spring behaves. If we want passive dynamic walking, what should the stiffness and damping be for each of these 10 springs? Possibly. Possibly. Low damping, however, means that the pieces are going to shake a fair bit. The number doesn't just specify high or low. It could be anything in, be in between, right? These are actually two floating point numbers. So if we don't know what these numbers should be, you know what answer I'm fishing for now, right? We're going to evolve them. OK, now, so to make sure that we understand what evolution is going to be playing with here, let's tally all this up. Uh, oh, sorry, one, one detail I forgot to mention is we're going to ensure uh, bilateral symmetry here, which means whatever changes evolution makes to one leg, that change is exactly the same on the other leg. So you never have uh, a point mass down here, a shank mass down here, and a... a uh, and a shank mass up here on the other leg. All the numbers are going to be exactly the same. So evolution is only going to specify numbers for one leg, and that's going to be copied to the, the other leg to determine the morphology of the other leg. With one exception, which is starting hip angle. That's just one number, which is for only one, one leg. It doesn't really matter which one it is, right, left or right. So we're talking about uh, like the morphology and is there anywhere we're calculating the overall energy used? Uh, there is nowhere that we're calculating the overall energy. The fitness function is just going to be how far down the ramp it gets without falling. Why are we not calculating the energy? There's no motors, right? So from our point of view as roboticists, this is as energy efficient as you can possibly get. Right? The only inefficiency is the feet rubbing against the platform and generating a little bit of heat because of friction, which we're not simulating in the simulator anyways. Right? You can't possibly make a robot that's more energy efficient, so we don't need to calculate energy and penalize it for energy usage. OK, so uh, how many total numbers is evolution going to be evolving? What does the genome look like for this robot? We're only evolving this set of parameters and this set of parameters, and there's no neural network. So we've got, uh, we've got five springs. And for each of the springs, we need two numbers. So we've got 10 so far. 22, right? So 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 21, 22, right? So we have, in this evolutionary algorithm, which we're going to look at in a moment, the genome is a vector of 22 numbers. And those 22 numbers, when we simulate a single robot, we move the robot to the top of the ramp, we extract those 22 numbers from the genome, which dictates the morphology of the robot, turn the physics on, measure how far down the ramp the robot moves without falling over, and that's the fitness for that genome of 22 genes. So far, so good? OK. OK, that's what we're going to see in uh, step one in a moment, which is the purely passive dynamic walking. This is the brain of the robot, which is going to be folded in as we, as we start evolution. Um, again, this should look pretty familiar to you. We've got our sensor neurons lined up here, our motor neurons lined up here, some hidden neurons here. We can see that there are actually some uh, backward connections here, so we have recurrent connections in there. So that's always a reminder to us that this robot has a little bit of memory if it needs it. And we have one new neural network building block that you haven't seen up till now, which is a CPG, or a central pattern generator. Central pattern generator is a special kind of neuron in our case, which is that it's basically a clock. It's going to emit a pulse at a regular time inter interval. So at a certain point in time, the CPG neuron will be set to 1. And then it, whatever these synaptic weights are, it will start to influence 
all of these neurons, which in turn influence the motors. So it can, the CPG can influence the motors. And then at the next time step, the CPG neuron is set to zero, and it stays silent. It stays at zero for a number of time steps, emits another one, goes back to zero, and so on. So actually, it's more like a metronome. It's setting a particular pace for the uh, neural network. It's called a central pattern generator because uh, uh, animals also have central pattern generators. You have a number of them uh, in your, your spine, um, and so do chickens. That's why when you cut off a chicken's head, it's able to run around for a while. The central pattern generators in the spine are emitting, still emitting regular patterns to the legs, which allow the poor chicken to run for, for a little while. Okay, so we have something in there that is setting this sort of beat for the network. We haven't talked about what the frequency of that beat is yet, but we'll come back to that. We can see that there are more or less two hidden neurons for each uh, motor, and we have our regular cast of characters for sensors. We have uh, angle sensors in there, which otherwise are known as proprioceptive sensors, so they're, receiving, they're returning the angle of the joint. Force sensors we haven't seen before. The force sensors are actually, yes? Uh, is, is there some, uh, some reason why the uh, uh, hidden uh, neuron is not connected to all of the sensors? It's not connected to all of them? No, uh, it's all of the sensors, uh, like, uh, like, you know, like, you know, two hidden neurons uh, for the uh, knees, uh, knee X, X, V, VL. Yes, to all you, the exactly. So, right, that's a good point. So not all the sensor neurons are connected to all the hidden neurons. They're trying to reduce the total number of synapses here, right? This is going to be a pretty complex evolutionary, or it's going to be a pretty large search space for the evolutionary algorithm, because we have 22 body parameters already. And then we're going to be adding to those 22 genes the synaptic weights as well. So they're trying to reduce this total connectivity. Which ones have they removed, Sam? Well, I have a question. Yep. Is this network really, is it really Uh, I'm sorry, you're, uh, you're right, I misspoke. It's not, tr this isn't a truly recurrent connection. It's only the CPGs that no, send signals to the hidden. That's right, there are no cycles in this, thank you. It's not a recurrent neural network. Okay, back to your question about why is this a not, a, not a fully connected network. Which synapses did they remove and why? Sorry? All the springs, which are the X. So the ankle, uh, the four sensors where it, which are attached to the springs in the ankle are only are only connecting to these hidden neurons, which only affect the ankle motor. Why is that? Why don't we have synapses going from the ankle springs up to the hips? Why did they remove those? It doesn't really need to be related to the hips at all. It's just going to complicate stuff. It's, it's going to complicate things a little bit, right? So they're, they're enforcing a little bit of locality. So if you think about it, as you're walking, as I rock forward and now my back foot is uh, compressed, this, the springs in my back ankle are being pulled apart. Or or pushed together, it doesn't really matter. They're being pulled away from their rest length. The force sensor is firing, saying the foot is loaded, meaning it's really back there, it's ready to go. And at a certain threshold, that'll fire the motor attached to my ankle and I will push off, right? So usually it's the sensors that are close to the motors that are most relevant. And that is true in us as well. There are, most of the synaptic connections are, are almost direct connections between strain sensors in, around your ankle, and they connect more or less directly to the muscles in your ankle. Imagine that your body had to send signals from your ankle up to your brain, process it with other stuff, and send it all the way back, right? Not a very efficient 
way to wire things, things up. So nature tends to clump things up as well and doesn't necessarily connect every sensor in every sense in your body to every muscle in your body. Doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? So they're building in some of that intuition here, which also allows them to have fewer synapses for evolution to, to optimize. Uh, this is an interesting one to try and figure out. They put in an inhibitory link that goes directly from the angle of the hip to the motor that's controlling the hip. Why is that in there, and why is it inhibitory? Well, if it reaches a certain, if the hip reaches a certain angle, that means it's starting to clump up. It could be, right? So that means that the angle of the hip is becoming very large. The leg is getting really far in front or really far behind vertical. Why does that angle inhibit the motor when it does that? Physics is, could work for it. The moment you're out really far in front or really far behind, there's probably a lot of gravity working on your leg. Yeah, when uh, you're not really exploiting gravity anymore after a certain point, you're kind of working with your muscles to extend your leg to take a longer step. Possibly, right? What is, this, well, what is this connection actually forcing the motor to do? When the leg really gets out in front or really far behind, this is the motor that actually controls that degree of freedom. Bring it back. Bring it back, right? That, that edge they just put in to make sure that this is guarding against the Ministry of Silly Walks, right? You don't get too extreme steps. So if any leg ever gets really far in front, that synaptic weight will push it in the opposite direction. Right. So this is, again, one of these few cases where you can put something into a neural network based on your intuition of the problem. Wouldn't that just help it walk faster? If you're like really far in the front, you want to push it back, and it goes forward faster. It's probably helping, which is, which is all good, right? Yeah. This is what you want. Yeah, you could count this as cheating if you want, right? If you're a purist, you'd say, let's just not build in any of our, our intuitions. Okay. Okay, um, like what I showed you before for the body parameters, this neural network here exists in just one of the legs, right? You'll notice that there are five motor neurons, and remember that there are five joints in an individual leg, two at the hip, one at the knee, and two in the ankles. So whatever the synaptic weights are for this network as dictated by evolution, they're going to take that entire set of synaptic weights and copy it into a second copy of this entire network. So there are these two networks which are identical sitting in the two legs. Okay, let's come back to the central pattern generator now. What does the central pattern generator do? Remember it's like a metronome and it's sending a beat at a certain frequency. It sends that beat with a certain frequency in antiphase to these two different networks. So when it ticks, it sends a tick to the left leg, and then a tick to the right leg, left, right, left, right. Again, by building in one of the intuitions about locomotion, which is whatever your legs do in response to their sensors, your legs should move in antiphase to one another. When you're lifting your leg, the other one should stay down. When you're swinging your leg forward, the other one should swing backwards or stay, stay planted, right? The legs do exactly the same thing, but in antiphase to, to each other. Okay, and the central pattern generator is going to help that happen by sending these signals in antiphase to the two networks. But depending on what neural network evolves and what body evolves, that dictates how the legs respond to that signal from the central pattern generator. So far, so good? OK. OK, so we've talked about the body. We've talked about the brain. Let's now have a look at the fitness function. Uh, again, I think this is a very elegant fitness function. It looks a little complicated at first glance, but it's, we can break it down into these one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six terms. Why is D sitting by itself and is unlike all the others, which is 1 over 1 plus something? 
very large distance as opposed to the other ones with the, the inverse plot, very small t that's in x. Exactly, right? So even before we figured out what t and x and z are, we can see at a glance from this that the investigators want to maximize d. They want to reward uh, genomes which produce high d, and they want to try and minimize or penalize all the other ones. Whatever, whatever, whatever robots occur, we want a robot that has high t, uh, high d, low t, low x, low z, and so on. I just, I'm having trouble seeing this as like an evolutionary thing. If there's no anti-cheat for it, and there's so much hand-holding. There's like, a fair bit of hand-holding because this is a pretty <laughs> tricky problem. Yeah, yeah it's like. You, you put the anti-phase, and so it, it can't even try to move one leg independent of the other, and That's you're kind true. of forcing it to do that, yes. assuming that we know the best way. Yes, you may not even be comfortable calling this evolution anymore, right? This is definitely like quite, a bit of, do something. Quite, a, quite a bit of hand-holding here. Yes, absolutely. Good point. Okay, so let's work our way through this. We know what distance is. That makes sense. How, much, for, how far down the ramp do we get before the robot falls over? Total amount of torque used. So torque is only going to come in when we get to the hybrid dynamic walking stage, right? In the, in the passive dynamic stage, there is no T because there are no motors, which means there's no torque. Remember, to torque is a rotational force, right? The amount of force that a motor is applying to rotate one object relative to another one. We want to minimize torque which maximizes energy efficiency. X is minimize hip rotation about the x-axis. So there's the x-axis there. What would a robot be doing if it's got large x? Big steps. Not quite big steps. Remember, notice here that it's about hip rotation, the cylinder, horizontal cylinder up around the waist. Uh, wait, uh, I'm sorry, I think I got that wrong. Hip, uh, hip rotation. Yeah, that's right. Hip rotation about the x-axis. Would that, would that be a, a turning or when they're like moving differently? Than the turning, other? yes, but not this turning. About the x-axis. This one, right? So pitch. There's yaw, pitch, and roll, right? So if you had a robot that had a high x, then the hip would be doing this as the robot was moving, right? So back to the Ministry of Silly Walks. Basically, you can think of this fitness function as saying, I want walking, but I don't want silly walking. And each one of these terms is a way to penalize a particular kind of silly walking. First one is large hip rotation about the x-axis. What about large hip rotation about the z-axis? This one, right? Rotation about the z-axis, which is pointing up, which would be walking like this, right? Which you might actually be able to get high d, and if you move, if the robot were to move relatively slowly, it might be relatively energy inefficient, but it's silly, and we don't want we we don't want that particular mode of locomotion. Feet rotation about the x-axis. That to prevent like. Some weird waddle step trip. Exactly, right? So we don't want the feet doing this as the robot is moving. And finally, hip rotation about the y-axis. What's that one? This one, right? So this is uh, penguin walking. We don't want this. OK, so we're going to try and minimize all those exaggerated ways of moving. You can be sure that the reason those terms are in there was because when the investigators first ran the ex this experiment, their fitness function was probably D. They got this. So they put 1 over 1 plus Y in there and said, good, all right, now it's going to work. They ran D times 1 over 1 plus Y, and then they got this. They put that in there. So this really isn't evolution, right? This is saying, here's what I want and all the ways in which I don't want it, right? It's a good reminder about, again, one of the open problems in this field, which is that the original goal I stated at the beginning of the course is we want to evolve robots to do something, but we don't want to tell them how to do it. 
but it's a very difficult thing to strike that trade-off because there are usually many, many more ways to do what you want in a way you don't want it done than the few or one way that exists for doing it in the way you actually want it done, which is efficient human bipedal locomotion. At the moment, uh, there's a lot of research going on in the field to figure out better ways to do it than just to than just this, but again, no one's found a satisfying answer to that one yet. Okay. Okay, so here we go. Now we're going to actually walk through some, uh, some evolution here. I mentioned that there are, there are two stages. They're going to evolve passive walking and then hybrid walking. There's actually a third stage after that where they're going to get hybrid walking without any sensory input, and we'll see that in a moment. In the third stage, they're going to try and maintain hybrid dynamic walking and gradually evolve in sensor influence or sensor-based walking. Let's start with step one, evolve passive uh, walking. So they're going to actually evolve synaptic weights from the CPG to the motor parameters. Oops, going the wrong way here. So all of the synapses that, go, that flow from the CPG to the motors are actually going to be evolved, which seems like a bit of a cheat, right? Because we said this was passive dynamic walking, no neural network. The reason why they're going to do that is the body is going to, be, is going to start at some initial position, and then the CPG is going to turn on for just one instant, which is going to, uh, which is going to uh, tense the motors for just one time step, which will get the robot moving, and immediately after that single time step, they shut off the CPG and they shut off the motors. So this robot is actually motorized for time step zero, but it's then passive for time step two through a thousand. So um, I, was, I, I had a quick question about this yep. morphology. So if L isn't analyzed at all in fitness function, yep. what's stopping the robot from having a very large L and taking that's a very good question. I, they don't say in the paper. My guess is that D is somehow normalized by L. Okay. I, that's my guess. I don't know. I, I think they took that into account somehow. <clears throat> is there a... I know there's gravity within the simulator, but is there a relative gravity where if the length was long enough, it wouldn't... the force upon the hip would be different as opposed to it being closer to the ground? Uh, no, I think gravity is constant throughout the open dynamics engine universe. Okay. But the weight changes with the size of the weight. The, which weight? The, these masses? Yeah. I don't think so. I think they're independent, right? You could have large L and small MT and vice versa. I don't think they scale them. I think they're independent. Oh, right. the weight is the weight is all in the cube. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Okay. So um, they're evolving the synapses from the CPG to the motor parameters so that evolution can decide how the robot tenses at the moment that it receives a signal from the CPG and then it goes passive. And then they're also evolving those 22 body parameters during evaluation of any individual robot, put the robot at the top of a decline plane, supply one CPG pulse, and turn off the network and see what you get. Make sense? OK. So they did that for several hundred generations. And unfortunately, they did not capture any video of their robots, which is really too bad. Would have been nice to, to see them. Um, we'll see from the graphs in a moment that they actually did get passive dynamic uh, walking. Okay, so after evolving for a while, they got passive dynamic walking. They got something that actually got to the bottom of the decline plane. They then paused evolution for a moment, expanded, uh, let's see, actually they didn't, they didn't expand the genome at this point. They kept the genome the same. They paused evolution, but they added in a term to the fitness function. Then they turned evolution back on, and they kept evolving the robots in the population for another couple hundred generations. Why did they add in this term um, 1 over 1 plus v? Uh, sorry, and I forgot to mention that during the second phase of evolution, every dozen generations or so, they gradually 
decreased the angle of the declined plane. So they're gradually making the declined plane less and less declined until towards the end of this second phase of evolution, the declined plane is perfectly horizontal. Y1 over 1 plus V. So they're obviously penalizing V. They want V to be as close to zero as possible. With the passive block being the most energy efficient, that seems to be the most energy efficient velocity, so they want the hybrid block to be the same. They want the hybrid velocity to be exactly the same, right? We have this passive dynamic walker that has evolved to walk down this decline plane. It has no motors, so whatever velocity profile it's showing as it walks is assumed to be as energy efficient as you can. So they're now going to add in the ability for the robot to actually supply torque to the motors, but the robot, when it's actuated, should move as similarly as possible to the best passive dynamic walker from phase one. Make sense? Okay. When are the motors being actuated? Well, that's down here. So what they do is they put the robot to the top of the decline plane. They rotate its leg to whatever angle it should be. They supply one CPG frequency to one leg, which causes the robot to tense, and it starts to fall forward. As it's falling forward, at the moment there is the first heel strike, as the foot comes down, the CPG at that moment sends a signal to the other leg. So at time step zero, send a signal to, let's say the right leg, doesn't really matter. Send a signal to the right leg, the robot starts falling, the uh, foot comes into con the heel comes in contact with the ground, send a CPG pulse to the left leg, and record the amount of time that passed between the first pulse and the second pulse, and that's the frequency. The robot keeps moving, and at that next time interval, sends a signal to the right leg, left leg, right leg, left leg. So the movement of the robot is dictating the frequency of the central pattern generator. So if I'm a robot and I only rotate my, my leg five degrees forward and my heel strikes pretty quickly, my CPG is going to be beating at a pretty high frequency. If I rotate my leg out pretty far forward and slowly start to fall forward, it takes much longer for my heel to strike, so my CPG will beat at a much lower frequency than the first robot. Make sense? So their, so their evolution is able to indirectly dictate the frequency of the CPG. Right? All of us have CPGs in our spines, and our CPGs dictate walking or movement at slightly different frequencies for all of us depending on our bodies and backgrounds and experience and so on. OK, any questions? OK, let's move into phase three now. So phase two, they now have evolved a hybrid dynamic walker, which is now able to walk on flat ground, where most of the time the motors are turned off. And they're only turned on when there is this pulse from the central pattern generator. Right? So most of the time it's passive, but like Denise, every once in a while the leg is getting a bit of kick from the motors, which is all well and good, but even if you watch Denise, she was pretty unstable, and the range of environments in which she could move was pretty narrow. Right? So let's try and broaden the stability of these evolved hybrid dynamic walkers by folding in sensors. Right? Why don't plants move? because you need a brain to move around, and you need to be able to sense your surroundings and change how you're moving based on what you sense. OK. So now they're going to reconnect the sensors to the neural network with small connection weights. So let's back up to the neural network. Remember in phase one and two, we were evolving these synaptic weights, but all of these synaptic weights were zero. There was no influence from the sensors. In phase three, they pause evolution for a moment. They now take that genome with those 22 body parameters and these synaptic weights and expand it further to include these synaptic weights. And they set those synaptic weights very close to zero to start with. 
Why? Why not just set them to random values in minus one to plus one? We've got our hybrid dynamic walker, which is able to walk on flat ground with no sensory input whatsoever. Why add in these synapses that, that come from the sensors that have weights that are almost zero, but not quite? It's, uh, it's, already, it's already at the ideal uh, morphology, so you don't need to worry about that anymore? You don't need to worry about the, the does anybody else have an idea? If it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? We already have something that's walking. Imagine that suddenly you change the brain of that walker where suddenly you turn on all its eyes and ears and all its other senses and all of the sensory information is flooding in and is influencing the motors. What do you think that robot is going to do? What's that? Just keep walking. No, it's not definitely not going to keep walking, right? Freak out. It's going to freak out, absolutely. Whatever it's going to do, it's definitely not going to be walking anymore, right? So it's like our robot is blindfolded, right? It has no senses. It's just learned to walk with no sensory information. Then we then uh, we take the blindfold and we make it slightly less uh, opaque, right? We allow it to see a little bit. We set these synaptic weights almost to zero, so there's a tiny bit of influence from the sensors on the walking, a little bit, right? So it's able, and then evolution continues. So now evolution can tune these synaptic weights to make the walking a little bit better, a little bit, sort of clean up the walking based on sensory information. For example, if my ankle is greatly flexed, push with my toe, right? So there are certain things that the robot will be better able to do with having sensory information. So we can sort of improve the walking a little, or evolution can improve the walking a little bit by gradually, gradually, gradually folding in this sensory influence. Make sense? Everything we're doing, or everything the investigators did in this experiment was gradual, right? If we suddenly make a big change to something, if you open up the hood of your laptop and randomly start moving things around, it's unlikely that your laptop's going to keep working, right? We need to make very fine changes. Revolution needs to make very fine changes as it goes. Okay, so now it's kind of interesting. You can see what's going on here. Here is one of the evolved robots, which is walking for 250 time steps across flat ground. We're looking at uh, information from just one of the legs. So we can see that the central pattern generator here is pulsing every 37 time steps or so. What happens at the moment that this leg receives an impulse from the central pattern generator? How does the leg respond? Sends um, high values to the hip and knee. Gradually. It sends, right, so suddenly the hip and the knee start to increase. So what is the leg doing? What does that mean? It's moving. How is it moving? The robot is moving forward. Let's start with the, let's start with the knee. What is the knee doing? So there's this central pattern generation. CPG pulse, what does the knee do in response? Flex. Flex, right? So we know that the knee can't rotate this way. It can only rotate this way. So we know the moment there's this CPG pulse, the knee does this, right? So when it, the yellow comes back to zero, zero is a full extension here, right? So the knee goes when it gets the central pattern generator. What does the hip do? The hip does the same thing. It's actually not clear from this picture whether the hip did this or did this, right? It either rotated forward or back. It's not immediately clear, but you're all expert bipedal walkers. What do you think the hip actually did? Forward, right? So it wrote, the hip went forward and the knee bent, which makes sense, right? So basically it's doing this whenever it gets the pulse from the CPG, and then 
relaxes again, right? So it's swinging back to zero, not because of the motors. Remember, the CPG is turned off. The motors are more or less silent. Ah, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, we're on, we're on step three here. So the motors are actually being influenced by the sensors a little bit. But regardless, they're going back to their default thing until the next one receives the pulse. And we know that the robot is bilaterally symmetric. So the other leg, when it receives its pulse, does the same, the same thing. Right? Questions? It doesn't seem like there's enough zero space. So like for the, for the hip slot, it goes from zero to 25, right? And then there's like a slot of about five, and then it seems to do that again. There doesn't seem to be enough hip space for uh, each individual hip to get its pulse and then rest back to zero. So is this for both hips? No, this is a single hip. So the hip rotates forward and then relaxes back almost to vertical, and then there's a, little, a second little hiccup there, which is either because the foot hit the ground and it bounced back, or maybe the sensors were telling it to do something in, during this time period. It's not really, not really clear. There's a little hiccup in the step. OK, so again, I apologize. There's no videos. You have to kind of imagine what this robot is doing based on, based on these plots. OK, what, what's the other advantage to sensors? Well, of course, sensors allow the robot to be more robust. So now, this is another reason I love this experiment. They just kept going. So we were in phase three. Now we're entering phase four, where they're going to continue evolving the robot for another 100 generations. But now in phase four, they're evolving the body. They're evolving the brain against that fitness function. And they're also now going to apply small, random external force vectors to the objects that make up the robot. So they're simulating wind here, right? The robot's being buffeted by wind as it's moving. And it's, a quote from the paper here, developed dynamic mechanisms to deal with noise, right? So uh, you remember the Big Dog video where they kick Big Dog? So there's a long... Uh, there's a long, proud tradition in robotics of torturing our robots by kicking them and pushing them and seeing how they, they respond. This was happening during evolution, right? So the robots, uh, presumably the body of the robots were changing a little bit by, uh, because of evolution, and the brain to better maintain that walk. Remember this 1 over 1 plus V term is in there. So it's always trying to produce as close to the previous way of walking as before in the, in the face of these new uh, perturbations. At the end of phase four, after 100 generations, they plucked the best robot out of the, at the end of phase four, and then they played it back 20 times, each time with uh, more and more wind, right? So up until, again, these are sort of unitless measures, so it's hard to say what five is, but up to five, there was no influence of the wind on the walking. It was able to take 38 steps before it fell over. And after that, it, would, it started to take fewer and fewer steps before it would get blown over. And when it was in the face of gale force, hurricane winds here, it would take five steps before falling over. But not bad, right? You would assume that the robot, before it was evolved with sensors, when there was any perturbation, it would fall over, like the passive dynamic walker and Denise, right? They're very unstable machines. OK, they keep going. So now we're into phase five. Now in phase five, they're going to continue evolution. But now every time they evaluate a new robot, they're going to introduce mistakes when building the body. So whatever L is supposed to be, L might be a little bit too big or a little bit too, or too long or a little bit too short. Did the same thing, evolved it with these little mistakes when the robot was built every time. And then at the end of phase five, they took the best robot uh, out of the population and they then reevaluated that robot multiple times now with a greater and greater percentage of error in the manufacturing process, if you like, right? Up to about 7% error, the robot was able to walk just like it did before. And then beyond that, again, it starts to take fewer and fewer steps. All right, you can see a, a smaller L and a larger L. Why do this? 
other than the fact that it's fun and an interesting thing to try. Why introduce mistakes to the way in which the body is made? Kind of, yeah, you could see it that way. But why would this matter to a roboticist? You're making it a lot more robust. We're making it robust to these body changes, absolutely. But again, why would a roboticist want to make robots robust to the body? You actually build it, you're not just building it. Absolutely, right? So if I asked someone down in the fab lab on the first floor here to 3D print a model of this machine, it's not that 3D printed model is not going to have exactly the same mass distribution as this robot, right? No matter how carefully they do it, manufacturing is not perfect, right? So they've made a robot that in this case is actually robust to manufacturing errors. That's kind of interesting, right? So if we make the robot slightly smaller, slightly bigger, at least in theory, it should still be able to, to walk. Uh, I know we talk about like the, the the error between simulation to real world application. The reality gap problem. Yep. And why don't and it's probably an obvious answer, but why don't we just build it and then build it in PyroSim as accurately as possible and evolve it there? Why don't we build it in PyroSim? No, build so oh, like build it in reality. In PyroSim and then we're trying to copy what we did in PyroSim in the real world. I see. Do it the other way. Yes, so you can take a physical robot, measure it as carefully as you can, build a simulation of it in PyroSim, yeah. evolve a controller for it in PyroSim, and then go back to the physical machine. Still doesn't work very well. Because there's still inaccuracies, right? There's still, there's still inaccuracies in the physics itself. Even if you get the dimensions right in the physics engine, there's still inaccuracies in the physics that, aren't, that are going to be exploited by evolution that's going to make it hard to transfer the evolved controller from simulation to reality. When we come back from spring recess, we're going to see four different experiments that address the reality gap problem. This definitely qualifies as a fifth way, right? May, may at least make the robot robust to manufacturing errors. Any other questions? Okay. I think this is this last slide. Okay, last one. Here we go. So now they wanted to see how robust the, the final robot was at the end of that uh, phase five to central pattern generator perturbations. What if the metronome inside the robot is not perfect? What happens? So it takes a while to stare at this picture to see what's going on. Let's pay attention to the magenta spikes for a moment. You'll notice they occur every 35 time steps or so. That's the evolved frequency for this robot. Around this point, they start to increase the frequency. You'll notice the horizontal, the, the spikes are slightly closer together, bunched closer together. What happens to the purple hills here? They start to decrease. What does that mean? Shorter strides, right? So if I was able to somehow magically go in and turn up the frequency of your, the central pattern generators in your spine, which dictate the frequency at which you walk, if the frequency, internal frequency in your spine was dictating signals to your legs at a faster frequency, how would you have to adapt in order not to fall over? Take shorter strides, right? So now the robot is walking like this but still walking, right? So it's walking a little bit more like Asimo. Now they go in and they tune down the frequency, so it's hard to see now, but now the frequency is less than 35 uh, time steps, so more than 35 time steps, and the robot lengthens its stride, which again makes sense. So if the frequency is less, you should have to take longer strides in order to, to keep up. Why would they bother, why, again, as roboticists, why do they care about CPG perturbations? Simulating a central pattern generator in code is probably like five lines of code. It's not like you're going to make a mistake there. Why test whether your robot is, uh, is robust to this? So the first thought was that not different slopes will cause the Absolutely. So again, when you're walking around campus today, pay attention to how you're walking. When you're walking down a decline, you will walk with a slower gait, right? The heel strikes will, will occur at a slower frequency, and you will generally take longer steps. 
It's icy out there. Don't take too long steps, but they'll be longer than your normal steps. And when you're walking uphill, your, your heel strikes are occurring at a higher frequency, and you tend to take shorter strides, right? This robot, although they're not changing the environment, they're changing the CPG, which is simulating changes in environment, is adapting its gait to different environments, right? One of the important building blocks of intelligence, right? I want to maintain a particular behavior, walking, in the face of different environments, right? I want to maintain a conversation with my friend while I'm walking, right? You can think, if you think about intelligence, a lot of intelligence boils down to maintaining doing something, keep doing something while something else in your environment is, is changing, right? Focus on your math homework while all, this other, all these other distractions are, are going on, right? It's an important part of intelligence. Okay, that concludes lecture 12 on bipedal locomotion. Any questions about lecture 12 or anything we've covered in the admittedly short history of evolutionary robotics. Okay, we have three minutes left, so we will just start in on lecture 13. Again, I apologize here. We're, uh, there's a little error in the schedule. We're actually now starting this new section on challenges. Because evolutionary robotics is such a new field, it's exciting because there are a lot of open problems out there that no one yet has a good answer to. The reality gap problem is one of those problems, which we're going to talk about uh, in a few weeks' time. We're going to talk in Lecture 13 about modularity. and We've already seen this one uh, crop up in a couple of other experiments. Let's have a quick look at this. Okay, so modularity is an important concept, not just, uh, not just in robotics. It comes up in uh, programming as, as well. What is modularity? Well, there's lots of different definitions of it, but for our purposes, we're going to think of modularity as tight coupling between, within a module, whatever that module is, and relatively few or no coupling between these tightly interconnected uh, modules. Right? So why do we bother trying to create modular code using object-oriented programming? The reason why, which will be useful for our robots as well, is if you create a modular system, this is actually true in code or any engineered system, if it's modular, you can go in and change or even remove a module or improve a module, and because the way in which that module affects other modules is well defined, usually you can maintain the behavior of the overall system. If you've ever written non-modular code, you'll know the inverse of this, right? You've got your one long piece of code, you make a change at this line, and things start to go wrong elsewhere in the, the code. Okay, so again, just to tie this back to computer science, um, we used to use the bullet physics engine, so I apologize, this should be ODE shape. So if you look in, in the C side uh, of uh, the C++ side of PyroSim, you'll st see stuff like this, where we define this module called the shape, and then we instantiate different versions of the shape, so cylinders, rectangular solids, spheres, and so on. We put together all of these modules, which are objects, into a higher order object, which is a body. That body is contained, combined with other higher order modules like neural networks and so on. We've spent some time in the assignments modularizing your code, which I hope will help you when you get to your final project, because maybe in your final project, you want to change the neural network of your robot. You want to add in some hidden neurons, for example, but you don't want to make any changes to the body. You should know that if you want to change the neural network, you know exactly where you need to make changes, and you should be confident if your code is modular that those changes are not going, you're, not, you're only going to have to make changes here, and you do not need to make changes in any other parts of your, your code. Okay, that's the advantage of modularity. We're going to see how this advantage crops up in evolutionary robotics. We will see that not next Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. Uh, have a good spring recess. There is a quiz due uh, tonight. Assignment 8, the quadruped, is also due not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday. See you in 11, 12 days' time.